Hello everyone. In this second video of uh, computer vision and image processing, we are going to continue our previous lecture on perspective projection, where we learned that the uh, pixel coordinates of any object, any feature, any point in the image plane U and V can be calculated by the perspective projection model, which U is alpha X over Z plus U naught, and V is beta Y over Z plus V naught. So clearly you see here, there are four parameters. If I call SX lambda alpha and SY lambda beta, there are four parameters involved in going from the 3D world into the 2D world, right? So those are alpha, beta, u naught, and v naught. And these four parameters are what we call intrinsic or inside the camera parameters. Now here you see I have mentioned five. What is it? I'll tell you in a second, but in general, Remember that we have intrinsic and extrinsic camera parameters. What are they? So if you have a point in the uh, 3D like this, you can describe this point P with respect to either the world coordinate frame, right? So say, hey, this point P has let's say this is x of the word frame, this is y of the word frame, and this is z of the word frame. You project this point onto these three axes, right? And get some coordinates. Let's show them with capital X, capital Y, and what? Capital Z. So this capital X, Y, and Z are the coordinate uh, of point P described in the word frame but we cannot immediately use those x y and z in the perspective projection if you look at the perspective projection this small x y and z that we have these are the coordinate of the point but described in which frame these are described in the camera frame these are P of that point described in the camera frame, not in the word frame. So we have to use the point P, but describe it into, with respect to the axis of this frame attached to the camera. So if this is Z of the camera, and then this is X of the camera, let's say, and Y of the camera, I have to first go from this P, which is in W, take it to C and the only difference between the board frame and camera frame is their origin. The origin of them is at different locations and their orientation is different. And this kind of transformation, which is a combination of a translation and what some rotations, this is what we call in um, terms of robotics or dynamics or many other mathematical formulations, we call it a, a, a rigid transformation, okay, which you can see here. If I have point P described in the word frame, all I need to do is to multiply it by a rotation matrix, which is rotation matrix of word with respect to the core, uh, camera, and then add to it the origin of the word with respect to the camera, which is basically this vector. This one. Okay, so if I have this D of the W in C and this rotation of W with respect to C, if I have these, then I can take my point, which is described as capital X, Y, Z, or in the word frame, I can bring it and describe it in the what? In the camera frame, small x, small y, and small z. Now that it's described in the camera frame, I can use my what? My perspective projection formulas and convert it into image pixels. So there are two steps, right? Now, the parameter involved, the parameters involved in going from word frame to the camera frame, we call them extrinsic camera parameters. And what are they? 
As I just mentioned, there are this um, position of the word in the camera or vice versa, and rotation of the word with respect to camera or camera with respect to word, one of them, okay? Because once you have uh, D of W in C, D of C in W is negative of that. Once you have R of W in C, R of C in W is transpose of that, okay? Please watch my video on uh, rigid body transformation or on rotation matrices under the robotics playlist or under the MATLAB playlist. And you can find a ton of information about the rigid uh, body or rigid transformation, okay? So I'm not going to cover this in details because I have covered it in several other videos, okay? Now, how many parameters do you need to describe this translation vector D and the rotation matrix R? Six parameters. Because as you know, a rigid body in general has six degrees of freedom, three translation and three rotation. So this vector going from center of word to center of camera, it has three components, X, Y, and Z. And, or in this notation later, we're going to show them with DX, DY, and DZ. And the rotation matrix in general is a function of three angles, okay? Now, as you know, a rotation matrix has nine entries. It's a redundant representation of rotation or orientation. But in general, you can go from any orientation to any other orientation by three rotations like Euler angles, for example, or pitch roll yaw for airplanes or for a camera, these three angles that you can go from any orientation to another orientation for a camera, we call them what? As you know, for a camera, we call them pan, tilt, and roll. Okay, so with these combination of these three angles, I can go from any camera orientation to any other. And let me describe them since we need to know them. Pan is a rotation about a vertical axis from the camera, okay? If you have this vertical axis, and if you rotate about this vertical axis, so the camera could be facing this way or the camera could be facing the other way, but do not lift the camera nose up or down, they call this, we call it the pan motion. For an airplane, similar to this, we call it yaw. But here we call it pan for a camera. Tilt is what? Tilt is basically a rotation about an axis that is coming out of your camera like this. So it makes the camera nose up or it makes the camera nose down, facing up or facing down, correct? For an airplane, we call this pitch. So this tilt is similar to pitch of an airplane. The pan is similar to yaw. And then we have also a rotation about the longitudinal axis of the camera, which basically does not change the way that the camera is uh, looking at the scene other than it kind of uh, rotates the image, but it does not change the angles or the fields of view, right? So this camera that is like this, now it can lay flat this way or it can be like at this angle or so. And for an airplane, again, if this is called roll, also for an airplane, we call it roll. Okay, so this pan tilt roll is similar to yaw pitch roll with pan being yaw and tilt being pitch, okay? These are the three important angles of any camera. Good, so we need these three angles to define the um, rotation matrix and we need three parameters to define the translation. Those six parameters together, all of those six parameters together are what we call extrinsic camera parameters or outside the camera parameters because they are between the word and the camera. There is nothing inside the camera these six guys refer to. So we call them extrinsic. Inside the camera, which is going from the camera frame to what? To the image plane, there are five general parameters we call what? Intrinsic parameters. What are they? Four of them we already learned. They are what? They are alpha, beta, and u naught and v naught. These four parameters are four of the in uh, intrinsic ones. What is the fifth one? The fifth one is an angle called theta. 
What is that? That's for the case that the two axes of the image plane are not perpendicular. So if you look here, this V axis and the U axis here are at right angle, 90 degrees. That's not necessarily always the case. For some cameras, you might have slightly different than 90 degree angle, okay? So you have something like this, where this theta is not 90 degrees. Now, it's not significantly different from 90. It's like 89, 88, or 91, 92, but it's not perfectly perpendicular, okay? If that is the case because of, I don't know, maybe it's purposefully made like that, or it's because of lens distortions or anything, then we can add this extra parameter theta. If parameter theta comes in, the relation between u, v, x, y, and z is a little bit more complicated. In this case, u is not as simple as alpha x over z plus u naught. One extra term is going to be added to you when theta is not equal to 90 degrees. And V is not simply going to be beta Y over Z plus V. It is going to be what? It's going to be something different than beta times Y over Z plus V naught. And that something different is beta over sine theta. So a denominator of one over sine or a denominator of sine theta is added to the V term if theta is not equal to 90. And you can clearly see if theta is 90 degrees, what's going to happen? Sine of theta becomes 1, so you get the first relation. And cotangent of 90, which is cosine over sine, is going to be 0. So this whole term is going to go to 0, disappears, so you get this term back. So you clearly see when theta is 90 degrees, you get your original equations back. But when theta is not equal to 90 degrees, your uh, uh, projective, uh, perspective projection model is going to be a little bit modified. So now the combination of alpha, beta, u naught, v naught, and theta, these five parameters are what we call intrinsic camera parameters. So in general, how many parameters does a camera have? 11, right? There, is, there are 11 parameters involved in a camera. So I can go from what? From the 3D world, I can go from this X, Y, and Z to what? To U and V. I need 11 parameters to make this projection happen. And when you take pictures, you do not have any knowledge of any of these 11 parameters, right? You just take a picture of something, some real world scene, and you get a digital picture. You take another one, you take another digital picture, and so on. You have no idea exactly what these 11 parameters are. Now, if it is important for you to estimate these 11 parameters, or at least some of them, the process of identifying these 11 parameters of a camera is called camera calibration. So camera calibration is what? To estimate these 11 parameters. How? By having some measurement data, which is basically if I can give you the coordinates of a point in the real world, if I give you uh, point X, Y, and Z, capital X, Y, and Z. And if I can tell you, hey, that point, that top of chimney that you saw at that specific location, X, Y, and Z, in the image, it is this pixel, pixel 250 and let's say 160, right? U and V. And then I do it for another point. Hey, this point here, or maybe this window here, this window that you saw at that XYZ is now this specific U and V, and repeat that for sufficiently number of points. If I can do that, then I'll show you how mathematically you can estimate all of these 11 parameters. As long as you have a correspondence between actual word, 3D word points and their pixel coordinates. If you have enough of those points, you should be able to estimate them. That process is called camera calibration. 
Okay, what do we need to do? The first thing is we have to write everything into matrix format. So this relations that I had, u equal alpha x over u naught and v equal beta y over z v naught, I'm going to write it in matrix format. How? The first thing I need to do is because x, y, and z are 3D, this is a 3 by 1 vector, and u and v are only 2 by 1, here, I'm going to artificially add a 1 to the u and v coordinate. So I can write the vector u, v, and 1 as a 3 by 1 as well. And when I add this extra 1 to the u and v, this artificial new coordinate of point u and v is what we call homogeneous coordinates. Again, if you don't know about homogeneous coordinates and homogeneous transformation, please watch my video on homogeneous coordinates and homogeneous transformation under playlist robotics or MATLAB. There is another one over there where you can see why we add this one, what's the advantage of adding this one, okay? Over there, I explained it mostly for this um, rigid body transformation. For rigid body transformation, if you want to combine rotation and translation into one single matrix, the best way to do it is using homogeneous. But here, you can also use homogeneous transformation to write the relation between u and v, x, y, and z into a simple matrix notation like this. So how do I go from a 3 by 1 to a 3 by 1? All I need is to multiply the 3 by 1 by a 3 by 3 matrix. And if I multiply it by a 1 by 1 scalar, the result's still going to be 3 by 1. But how do I do that? Well... Remember, u is what? u is 1 over z alpha x plus u naught. v is 1 over z beta y plus v naught. Right? This u naught and v naught, I can write them as u naught times 1 and v naught times 1. And where is this one? This one is here. X and Y are also there. That's good. The only problem is, what about this 1 over Z? Because you know 1 over Z is nonlinear relation. A matrix format, you can write stuff in matrix format if they are linear transformation. This is nonlinear. So what do I do here? I do a trick and I say also not only U and V are those relations I can write as 1 is equal 1 over z times z if you don't mind that's also both sides equal 1 right so now the third equation has a 1 over z just like first and the second equation and so the next thing that you need to do is to factor out that 1 over z out of all of these equations so if you do so, the top one should be, um, as you can see, alpha times x plus u naught times z. And this one is going to be 1 over z of beta times y plus v naught times z. And... Uh, this one is just 1 over z times z, so now this 1 over z can be factored out, out of everything. And these terms that I uh, encircle with black marker, those terms can be written as a linear combination of x, y, and z. Right? Which you can see, this is alpha. There is no y, there is u naught, then this one, there is no x, there is beta y, and there is v naught z, and the last one is just 1 times z, 0, and 0. And so this matrix that you see here, or here, this is the k matrix. 
This is the intrinsic uh, transformation matrix or intrinsic matrix in general, you might call it. And this is so far writing the uh, transformations inside the camera in the matrix format. And we can also do a similar thing for outside, which we did already. If you remember, we had this um, rigid body transformation. So now we can combine the rigid transformation and this new uh, matrix format, which of course has, still has the nonlinear term 1 over z in it. But we can combine them and end up with the final equations. Just one thing to emphasize, and in case that we consider the angle theta between u, not, u axis and v axis to be not equal to 90 degrees and just arbitrary theta, I just told you that the uh, per, uh, perspective projection equations are going to be these guys, and you can still write these guys as 1 over z k times x, y, and z. This time your k is going to look a little bit different. I mean, this element that was zero is now going to be negative alpha cotangent of theta, and this element that was beta is now going to be beta over sine of theta. Everything else is the same. Good. So you either use that k or this k. In general, you use this one. If you want to estimate all 11 parameters, you use this k. So now I have a simple relation uv and 1 is equal 1 over z k times x, y, and z. And then the x, y, and z themselves, if you want to write them in terms of capital x, y, and z, which are the word coordinates of the point, they can be written in terms of a homogeneous transformation matrix, this one h of w in c which involves the rotation matrix and the transformation vector and here we are using the homogeneous coordinates again to allow this transformation to happen because this these guys are four by one and this uh, homogeneous transformation matrix h is four by four so now if we combine these equations one and two we can write our u, v, and 1 in terms of capital X, capital Y, capital Z, and 1 as what? So P, which is the homogeneous transformation, homogeneous coordinates of the pixel, u, v, and 1 can be written as 1 over Z, a matrix M times the capital P. Okay, this capital P is the homogeneous... Uh, coordinate of the word point so it is a four by one this guy is u v and one so this is a three by one and uh, one over z is a scalar this m which relates the word coordinate to the pixel coordinate this matrix it is a three by four matrix so the transformation is done by multiplying by M matrix and then dividing by the depth. This is how you relate these two together. The M matrix, you can show that it is the K matrix that we derived earlier, the intrinsic matrix K. It is either this one or this one, as I said. Multiplied by what? By the rotation matrix and the transformation vector remember that k is 3 by 3 r is 3 by 3 and d is 3 by 1 so when you concatenate r and d this combination here that guy is already a 3 by 4 so when multiplied by 3 by 3 the result still 3 by 4 this m matrix which is uh, a matrix involving all of your 11 parameters, remember five of them in K, three um, implicitly in R, and three in D, right? These 11 parameters are all embedded in matrix M. We call it the camera projection matrix. 
So the M matrix is the most important matrix that you have with any camera, okay? And if we expand it in terms of the components of K, R, and D, this is how it will look like. The only thing I have to mention here is the component of the transformation, the translation vector D, we consider them DX, DY, and DZ. And instead of showing the rotation matrix in terms of the three angles, because then it's going to involve a ton of sine and cosine, what we did, we considered each row of this matrix as a specific parameter, R1, R2, and R3. Okay, so R1, R2, and R3 are the three rows of this matrix. Each one of them is a 1 by 3. And uh, we consider these three to be what? To be basically the three rotation parameters instead of the three implicit angles. You know that for a rotation matrix, these rows, they are all unit vectors, means magnitude of R1, R2, and R3 are all one. And each one of them is perpendicular to the two others. So like R1 dot R2 is the same as R1 dot R3 is the same as R2 dot R3. This is all what? Zero. Okay, they are all mutually perpendicular to each other and their magnitudes are all what? One. This is a condition for a matrix to be what? a rotation matrix or we call it an orthonormal matrix so these r's are not just each one containing three independent parameters no there are nine parameters nine numbers in general in all of these r's but there are six constraints so um we have to keep that in mind so anyways if we expand it in terms of r123 dx dy dz and then alpha beta u naught and v naught this is your M matrix, this is with the simple K. If we expand it in terms of the more complicated K, which has theta in it, then this is going to be your M matrix down here, this guy. This equation four is the uh, camera projection matrix in the most uh, complicated format of it, okay? So uh, now the question is, how do I calculate these 11 parameters right let's say i have some pairs of capital p and small p right i know where a point is in the word frame and i know which pixel corresponds to that point so i have capital x y and z and i have u and v if I know this combination X, Y, Z, and U, V for a bunch of points, can I estimate these 11 parameters? Right? Alpha, beta, U, not V, not theta, and then the rows of rotation matrix and DX, DY, and DZ. Yes, we can. It's not super easy mathematically, but yes, we can do it. And this process, as I said, we call camera calibration. How? Let's take a look. Okay, so what we do here is we expand this relation P small equals 1 over Z M times P capital in terms of what this time? In terms of the rows of the M matrix. So if I call the rows of the M matrix M1, M2, and M3, this time each one of these rows are 4 by 1 vector. Remember, M is 3 by 4. So each row is, uh, there is, there are four elements in each row of M. If I do that and expand it, what's going to happen? Well, when I multiply M1 by P, it's like a dot product. Because P is a column vector, M is a row vector. So when I multiply, it's like a dot product. So M1 times P is going to be a scalar dividing by Z. That's another scalar. That gives you U. When I do the same thing with M2 and then P and divide by Z, that's going to give me V. So that's what you see over here. That U is going to be M1 times P divided by M3 times P. 
v is m2 times p divided by m3 times v and you might say where are these denominators coming from well these denominators are the replacement for z remember when i expand as i said u is going to be 1 over z m1 times p but well, what is z itself for z i need to look at the third element the third element is going to be what it's going to be 1 equals 1 over z times what m3 times p so if i cross multiply clearly you can see that z is what m3 times p and that's what you see here which by the way has a meaning the meaning is this this parameter z that you have in your transformation remember this is your transformation this parameter z that you have is not independent from m and p so it's not like your um, transformation or the final result small p is the product of three terms that are independent m p and z no this z is uh, implicitly calculated by the m matrix the third row of it and the p vector and that's what you see i have used in the denominator of u and v m3 times p that's your z term so u is going to be m1 p over m3 p v is going to be what m2 p over m3 p and if i cross multiply each one of these two new results guess what I will get M1P minus U times M3P is equal to zero. And similarly, M2P minus V times M3P is also equal to zero. And what is this right now? Well, as I said, imagine I give you the P and I give you the U and V, which is the small p, correct? If I do that for a specific point, it means I have this p and I have U and V, right? How many equations do I have here? Two equations. How many unknowns do I have? Well, I have the three rows of M which involves what? 12 unknowns. So expanding my projection equations for a single set of word coordinate and pixel coordinate will give me two equations and what? 12 unknowns. But guess what? If I have a lot more than one set of point, one point, capital P and small p, if I have a bunch of these, right where i can go from one to n let's say i have n pair of points word coordinate image coordinates if i have that then what then what's going to happen you're right then instead of two equations i will have two n equations but my unknowns are the same unknowns m1 m2 and m3 so i can get what I can get an over-constrained set of equations and I can solve it using the least squares method. Now you might say, why should you do so? Why can't you use exactly six points? If I use six points, then I will have 12 equations and 12 what? Unknowns and guess what? That is exact solution. Why should I bother solving a least square problem when I can only go with six points? And you might be right, why should I solve an over-constrained system when I can solve a square system? The main reason is this, the errors. These equations, although clear, but they do not take into account the errors that can happen with many of the calculations, right? When you calculate U and V, the image pixel coordinate, you just do your best, right? You just do your best. Let me show you an example. Let's say here we go back to some of these uh, previous pictures. 
So let's say here, for example, uh, if I can zoom in, if I know exactly the XYZ, capital XYZ of that corner in the world, First of all, can I exactly measure it perfectly? Let's say if I know my X, Y, Z of the word are here. Is there no error in my measurement of the coordinate of that point? Yes, there is. Each one of these have some errors in them. What about when you go zoom into that specific location and look at that pixel? Is there a uh, chance of error that you calculate the location of that point one pixel to the left or right? So this U and V that is given to you or you calculated yourself, do they have error? Of course they do. So none of these values, X, Y, Z, capital and U and V are free of error. They all have some chances of error, especially the pixel coordinates. It's just enough that you go one or two pixels to the left or right if there is no clear sharp corner points. Okay, at the end of the day, remember the images are a bunch of pixels. And if that corner is somewhere between these two pixels, you're not exactly sure which one to choose. And we're going to see that in one of our uh, future uh, videos when we talk about image processing. You see the image is clearly, as I told you, a bunch of pixels, a bunch of light intensities. So let's say here, if I want, this is the ear of this uh, horse, if I want to say I want exactly the middle point, how do you exactly know where it is? Is it this point here? Is it this point? Is it this point? Right? Even if you know it looks like kind of a little bit corner like this, Still, it's not clear whether it's this pixel, this one, or this one. Okay, so at the end of the day, your calculations do have error. And the good thing with the list of squares is it tries to give you some estimates for M1, M2, and M3 with the maximum information that it can get from all sorts of these capital P's and small P's. And hopefully, the errors of those terms kind of uh, cancel each other, moderate each other's effect. And the estimate that you get for M1, M2, M3 are more reliable than just using six points if you use, let's say, 20 points or 30 points or 100 points. So now here is exactly what I told you in these formulas. The only difference is when we get these expanded equations, we take a transpose of them. Why do we do that? Because if we do so, then my equations, instead of M1, it's going to be M1 transpose, M2 transpose. And what's so special about M1 transpose? Remember M1, M2, and M3, they were all what? I told you they are all 1 by 4. So now these guys are going to be what? Are going to be 4 by 1. Right? These guys are going to be 4 by 1 or a column vector, and what I will do, I basically put them on the top of each other, stack them on the top of each other, and make this 12 by 1 vector of unknowns. Remember, we had 12 unknowns, so now we put all of the 12 unknowns into one giant column vector. And the coefficient matrix of that this time, which involves the same things that I said earlier, but instead of uh, P, now you have what? P transpose. Instead of zero, you have zero transpose. U and V are scalar, so transposing them is not going to do anything. So now I'm going to write those equations that I just showed you into a matrix format using this transpose values, right? And uh, here, I have more than one point. So the first two rows belong to the first set of capital P, small p points. Then uh, the second two rows belong to the second set of points all the way to the last two rows, which belong to the nth point and set of points. And in all of them, as I said, this uh, 
vectorized version of matrix M, this 12 by 1 unknown vector is the same. So my set of equations can be written as Q times M equals 0, where Q is this um, basically coefficient matrix with all known values. M are the 12 unknowns and 0. And clearly, this set of equations is what? This is an over-constrained set of linear equations. Because you have more equations than 12. You have 12 unknowns, but more than 12 equations. So you assume that the number of points n is bigger than 6. I'll show you when we do in math lab, we typically use n of 20. Use 20 set of points. Now, when you have an over-constrained set of equations, the right-hand side, you can never get it to be perfectly zero. It's impossible, right? Because you, have, you do not have enough of parameters. You do not have enough of unknowns. So your right-hand side is always is going to be an error term, which is not equal to zero. Could be negative or positive. So how would you solve this? Each one of those E terms, because there are 12 of them, right? E, I, I goes from 1 to 12. Each one of them, you will square them. And some of this, as I goes from 1 to 12, you try to what? You try to minimize this cost function, which is called the least squares curve fitting or regression polynomial regression really i have a video under my playlist numerical analysis please watch that if you want to gain more information about least squares curve fitting and if you do so then you can show that the solution m star the solution that minimizes the sum of squared error is going to be what is going to be the eigenvector for what for the matrix Q transpose Q, remember this Q matrix is not a square matrix. It is a 2n by 12 matrix. But if you transpose it, Q transpose is going to be 12 by 2n. And if you multiply it by Q, the whole result is going to be 12 by 12. So the result of Q transpose Q is a square. It has 12 eigenvalues and 12 eigenvectors, which are different from each other. How would you know? Because this matrix Q transpose Q is positive definite. So it has distinct positive eigenvalues and different eigenvectors. Now, the eigenvector associated with the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix Q transpose Q, the eigenvector for that, that's the solution to what? To this problem. Or you can use pseudo inverse, as I mentioned in the video under numerical analysis playlist. So this M star is now your solution. There we go. Now you have found all of the 12 entries of matrix M. And once you found all of these 12 entries, the first four entries in that vector are going to form your first row. The second four entries are your second row. And the last four entries of M are the last row of what? Matrix M. So from this M star, you can form what? The matrix M. Good. So now, good. With a set of points, real world and image coordinate, I found the best solution for matrix M. At least the square solution. Now, how do I get all of those 11 parameters? Let's go ahead and work on that. Okay, now this is what I do. The solution M star that I found, remember it is a 3 by 4, I break it down into a 3 by 3 and a 3 by 1. And I call them A and B. Capital A, small b. Now, the... 3 by 3 submatrix of M, A, I can consider it to be three rows, A1, A2, and A3, all of them being A1 by 3. Good. 
you can show that if m star is a projection matrix you can show that the determinant of the matrix a should not also be what zero that's a condition for m uh, solution m star to be a projection matrix now with all that being said what form should this uh, solution m star take in terms of the 11 parameters this is the format equation 4 that I showed you earlier in terms of alpha, beta, u0, v0, r1, 2, 3, dx, dy, dz, and angle theta. Good. So now we say that this M matrix with this format that it has corresponds to what? To A and B. Correct? Right? So that thing... That whole thing is now corresponding to what? A1, A2, A3, which are all vectors, and then the components of B, B1, B2, B3, which are scalars, and the whole thing times the scaling factor rho. So rho is a scalar factor. And you might say, well, where did you get this scalar factor? Where Wasn't M star supposed to be A times B? That's right. So what is this row doing here? That comes from the fact that remember how we determined the M star. The M star comes from this vector M star, right? Small M star. And what is this M star? That's an eigenvector. And if you know from eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the only thing that we can find about an eigenvector is its what? its direction correct although it's a vector and a vector has direction and magnitude when we find eigenvectors the only thing that we can find about them is their direction we can never find their magnitude we typically go and choose an arbitrary magnitude like magnitude one we call it normalization or so but in general finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a system that does not have a unique solution please watch my videos on eigenvalues and eigenvectors and you'll find about that so this m star although it can correspond to this uh, general formula matrix m it could be also a scalar multiple of that because all i know about this m star or the corresponding solution m star is a direction of it i don't know its magnitude so although this should correspond to each other but there is a scaling factor because of not knowing the magnitude that is missing that's why i say i also need to say the um, m and the m star are the same except for a scaling factor rho that is unknown and i still can find that as well i'll show you i can find that rho as well but this is why we are adding this row. Just wanted to explain that. Good. So now what? Now let's see how we can find the parameters. So now we are going to look into this portion of M. And this portion of the right hand side, row times A. right? Because this row is multiplied by both A and B. And that's what you see over here. Okay, now can I find something finally? Yes. What? If you look at the last row or the last equation, it says row times A3 is R3, right? Row times A3 is what? R3. What is the unknown here? The unknown is R3. The third row of the rotation matrix. The row is also unknown. And A3 is known because A3 comes from the solution M star. It's the third row of A. So this one is known. Now, remember rho is a scale factor. A is a matrix, A3, and R3 is a unit vector. So, rho is not going to affect the direction of A3, it's just a scaling factor. 
and r3 is a unit vector so all r3 shows is the direction so if r3 is a number times a3 what is r3 itself r3 is the vector divided by its magnitude which is exactly what you can see over here so if i divide vector a3 by its magnitude that gives you the third row of the rotation matrix r3 yes good and what is about a row how can i find row well from here remember if i take magnitude from both sides if i take magnitude from both sides magnitude of r3 is one is a unit vector so what does it mean it means a row which is a scalar the absolute value of it of course times magnitude of a3 ought to be what one so what is rho then rho is going to be one over magnitude of a3 but it's absolute value of rho so rho can be plus or minus one divided by what magnitude of vector a3 so here you found the scaling factor although nobody really cares here about the scaling factor later we need to use the scaling factor in order to find all other parameters so although you don't need it for r3 but you need to find this row because you need it in so many other equations for finding other parameters so you have to find this scaling factor row and the question is where do i use plus one or minus one so we say plus one is if the uh, scene or the word scene or let me say the 3d scene and the image plane are on the same side Negative 1 is if the 3D scene and the image plane are on different sides. And you might say, what does that mean? Well, for that, I need to take you back to the previous video. If you remember when we talked about the pinhole camera model, here you can see that the word scene is on one side of the pinhole, the image plane is on the other side, and that what makes these two to be what? Different from each other. The uh, image appears upside down, correct? But as I said, when we do analysis, and when we do the projection, perspective projection model, what we can do is we bring this um, image plane, fill up it, and bring it on this side. So now your um, pyramid that you had like this, correct? This is still the scene. But now the image plane is on the very same side. So it is going to be like here. Okay. So now this is going to be the image plane. And that makes that person to also be upright. This distance still the focal length. It's just the way that we do the analysis. So it depends on how the image appears. And in most of the cases, the images are the same as the real world picture. They are not upside down. Right? So that's, you might consider, hey, maybe I should use the negative case. Okay? But clearly, uh, the magnitude of rho is not going to change. It's just going to be 1 over magnitude A3. 
okay and a simple uh, check as I showed you in uh, as I'll show you in my next video on MATLAB uh, cal camera calibration I can easily show you uh, where this row being positive or negative is going to affect anything as you can see from these equations that I'm going to drive in a second for you the only place that the sign of rho will have any real effect is the translation vector. Because in all other places, it has a power 2. So whether it's positive or negative of something, the square of that is going to be positive. The only place is this, uh, basically, translation vector. And I'll, I'll talk about the effect of that later. Okay, so now the question is, how do you find these? Well, as you can clearly see, for these, I need to do dot products. So first, let's say, I say row A1 is this one. And then row A3 is this one. And then I dot product the two results. So if I do so, what, what do I get? It's row A1 dot row a3 right which is clearly row squared a1 dot a3 this is equal to alpha r1 minus uh, alpha cotangent of theta r2 and then plus u naught r3 the whole thing dot r3 and here you take advantage of the uh, constraints I told you about the rows of the rotation matrix. Dot product of R1 and R3 is 0, R2 and R3 is 0. Only R3 and R3 is 1. So the result of that whole dot product is simply U0. There we go. So U0 is equal to rho squared A1 dot A3. Similarly, you do the second row, row A2, to be this guy and dot product it with A3. The result is again going to be V0. So V0 is going to be row squared A2 times A2 A dot, A dot A3. So, so far, I could easily show you how to get the location of the center of the image plane, U0 and V0 as well as the third row of the rotation matrix. So three out of the 11 parameters are calculated with these formulas. Now, how can I get the rest of it, right? So there are several things you can do here. First thing is you have to calculate the angle theta. And this is the formula for it. It involves cross-producting the rows of matrix A. 2 times A1 with A2, A2 with A3, A1 with A3, A2 with A3, and then dot-producting those resulting vectors, dividing by magnitudes with the negative. That's cosine of theta. And I guess if we really want to do it, we can. But it is going to take a lot of the video time for me to prove that. So for the moment, I want you to take this from me. If you want, as extra homework, you can basically do that. We can uh, this time use cross product to calculate alpha and beta using these formulas. I can show one of these to you as well. Let's say the simpler one, beta, if I want to show it to you. Say cross product row A2 and A3. And if you do that, what you need is this one. And this one, cross product them to each other. One of them corresponds to row A2. One of them corresponds to row A3. So when I do that, the result is going to be row squared A2 cross A3. And it is going to be B over sine theta R2 cross R3. And R2 cross R3 is R1, so it's going to be beta over sine theta R1, and then plus V0 R3 cross R3, and you know that is 0. So 
So if I multiply both sides by a sine theta, right, since and take magnitude of that, since magnitude of R1 is 1, it's going to give me beta. So beta is going to be what? Magnitude of rho squared sine of theta A2 cross A3. And rho squared and sine theta are scalars. They come out. And so you only be down to magnitude A2 cross A. Uh, sorry, this one. A2 cross A3. Okay. This is the magnitude, this is the rho squared, this is sine. So you can similarly show something for alpha. It takes a little bit more effort, but you can do it. Cosine theta I showed you. And then with similar things, you can now do A2 and A3. If you just do cross product of A2 and A3, right? We remember, if we just did A2 and A3, the result of A2 cross A3 was beta over sine theta R1. So it's R1 but multiplied by a scalar. So if I divide this vector by its magnitude, which is this, the result is clearly what? R1. Once I have R1 and R3, as I told you, by cross product, I get R2. And finally, how do I get my D? For D, I have to go back here. Rho times B is corresponding to what? To, uh, or Rho times A and B, if you will, that is equal to what? Remember, if I want to write it, Rho times A and B. B is equal to M, and M itself was K times R and D. The unknown is D. Remember, B, A, and Rho, they are all that they are all known and determined. What about K? Do I know matrix K? Yes, K involves what? K does involve alpha, beta, u naught, v naught, and theta. And guess what? I have already found all of those five parameters, as well as the rotation matrix. The only thing I haven't determined is D. Everything else is known. So the matrix K is completely known. If I go back here, and R is also completely known. So if I look at the correspondence... If I look at the second part, it means rho B is equal to K, correct, times D. Can I find D from here? Can I say D is equal to K inverse rho times B? The answer is yes, and that's exactly what you see down here. And done. So now I got D as well. I got R. I got K. And that means all of the 11 parameters are known. So my calibration is over. Okay. Now here in the next video, I show you how to use MATLAB calibration camera calibration app. And how to take pictures of a chessboard, asymmetric chessboard and how to use those data to uh, basically perform all these calibrations using the application. So you don't need to write a code to uh, basically if performs all the calculations for you. But if you want to do that, you have to go through all of these formulas that I showed you here in this red box down here, this one. If you apply the equations in this red box down here, this last one, that is all you need to know. The only thing is if you want to do it automatically, if you want to do this process automatically and without any supervision, you have to uh, know the corresponding between real world 
points and their pixels. And that's not necessarily trivial, right? Because for us humans, I say, yeah, that's the picture of top of a car, that's the bottom of a car, that's the window of a car, and so on. And um, even if I know P, right, if I know P, which is all X, Y, and Z, if I know this from some real-world measurement, finding the corresponding P, U, and V in an image is not that trivial. And that's the smartness about the MATLAB calibration app. It uses one of the simplest patterns in the real world that it can use a chessboard. And it tries to use that where the relative location of each point with respect to the uh, surrounding points, the adjacent points, is clear. All you'll see that it is going to ask you is the size of one edge. Okay, so that's one of the smart features of camera calibration app that we'll see in the next video. So hopefully this video, which involved a lot of math, was useful to you, knowing the increasing and extrinsic camera parameters and how to mathematically calculate them. Thank you so much. I will see you in my next video.